Good morning and welcome to our monthly webcast. I am Samir Mehta, your moderator, and this is a very special event today. It is four years since we started this program, but most critically, today is also the first anniversary of our partnership with the American College of Cardiology. We have several important uh, people joining us today. Most of all, I am delighted uh, to invite and welcome Dr. Valentin Fuster. I know that most of what we have done in this room, it has been under his stewardship. Uh, a lot of this would not have been possible. Uh, Dr. Valentin Fuster is the director of the Mount Sinai Heart Institute and the physician in chief of Mount Sinai Medical Center. Dr. Fuster, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please uh, give us uh, a message how we have performed and how can we do a better job with this webcast. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. It depends where you are. Uh, this is a very special occasion. Uh, this is one year since I have been watching this program uh, under the tutoring of the American College of Cardiology and Dr. Samin Sharma and certainly Mount Sinai. My first comment is congratulations. Congratulations to the American College. Personal congratulations to Dr. Sharma and Dr. Sharma's team. They have done a beautiful job. And certainly I feel very proud that Mount Sinai, I believe, has put the infrastructure and the heart and the passion to make this to happen. Maybe uh, as a cardiologist, not necessarily involved with intervention, uh, I would like to give a message, a very simple message. And that is that despite of all the advances with all these mechanical interventions, we are not treating the patients medically in an appropriate way. I think uh, it has become clear through the freedom trial, to the body trial, to the courage trial, that only 20% of patients undergoing intervention, and particularly the group with diabetes, only 20% are properly treated uh, medically. In 80%, the risk factor profile continues to be abnormal. So if I have to give a message when you said, what can we improve? I think what we have to improve is to really be aware that of all these beautiful things that were presented in this program, there is a issue afterwards when the patient goes home in which perhaps we have to pay more attention to. And is to communicate with the physicians, to better communicate with the patients, and certainly to give the best treatment for the hypertension, for the hyperlipidemia, for the diabetes, for discontinuation of smoking, and that is we have to pay attention to that. This is my message. Well, I just like to finish by saying how grateful, how honored I feel to be part of all of this. And thank you again to the college, to Samin Sharma, and certainly to all of you at Mount Sinai that pay uh, so much detail to, for this to be a success. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Fuster, thank you so much. Uh, this message will resonate uh, to more than uh, 6,000 cardiologists who are going to be watching this program in more than 120 countries. Uh, and all I can tell you personally is uh, not only uh, will I continue to, to cheer on this message, uh, we'll always remain mindful and thank you for all those uh, wonderful words. Uh, I'm also delighted to introduce to you Dr. Jagat uh, Narula, without uh, whose uh, efforts this partnership with the American College uh, may not have been possible. Uh, Jagat is the director of the Mount Sinai Heart uh, Network and uh, most importantly, he's also the editor-in-chief of JACC Imaging. Jagat, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, what can you share with us uh, about this, particularly as to how it reflects with the American College of Cardiology? Uh, thank you, Samir, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Fuster, Dr. King, and uh, Dr. Samin Sharma and team. And essentially, this is the uh, educational mission of Mount Sinai at its best. 
um, Dr. Sharma, uh, congratulations, Dr. Kinney, congratulations, and the whole team, congratulations for this momentous uh, occasion. And uh, essentially, it is becoming a United Nations of uh, the interventional education, uh, where more than 126 countries are involved in it, more than 10,000 hits every single month on the internet, uh, people looking at this uh, uh, educational mission of Mount Sinai. So Dr. Sharma, you've done a fantastic job and we congratulate you once again. Essentially, this is also coupled with the, the educational mission that Mount Sinai follows, the famous and uh, the popular conferences which uh, have been conducted uh, uh, through Dr. Fuster, the Fuster Symposium of New York, which draws approximately 2,000 people every single year and has been going on for years now, actually decades now. Now, also the Fuster India Symposium, which brings in approximately 700 people, and the Fuster Brazil symposium with the American College of Cardiology which brings in approximately 1500 people so essentially the American College of Cardiology partnership is extremely valuable here and we are grateful to the American College of Cardiology for this wonderful partnership we hope that we will be able to reach more and more people we are thankful to them and I wish and pray that this partnership continues to be for long and that we enlighten the world together. Thank you very much, Samir. Jagat, uh, thank you for uh, those kind words, for your wonderful support. And uh, both Dr. Fuster and Dr. Narula stay with me for a moment and say hello also to our uh, chief guest today, whom I have invited to commemorate our uh, first anniversary with the American College of Cardiology. Uh, Dr. Spencer King is there in the cath lab, and I feel particularly privileged to introduce Dr. King to our global, global audience. Uh, Dr. King is the past president of the American College of Cardiology and the editor-in-chief of JACC Interventions. With uh, his leadership, vision, and deep commitment to education, Dr. King has enriched the college in numerous ways for decades. Without uh, Dr. King's brilliance, his devotion and hard work, interventional cardiology would simply not have reached its wide application and global prestige. Dr. King has been involved with angioplasty since its inception. He was a colleague and personal uh, friend of Dr. Andres Grunsik. And I have enjoyed listening to many uh, stories from Dr. King about the early days of angioplasty. Uh, during uh, Dr. King's long tenure at uh, Emory University, he trained and mentored hundreds of operators. Some of these physicians are the best known interventional cardiologists in the world today. Dr. King has also been a prolific researcher and a genuine innovator. I do not believe there is any angioplasty device whose origin cannot be traced in some manner to Dr. King. In the same way, Dr. King's signature is present on almost every PCI guideline. In addition to all these contributions to interventional cardiology, there are two special achievements that I want to recognize Dr. King for. For uh, his work in these projects, uh, which Dr. Fuster you also alluded to, Dr. King has been the voice of reason in cardiology and our call to conscience. For these areas, first of all, is a scientific role and rational application of cardiac surgery to treat coronary artery disease, almost similar to what uh, Dr. Fuster you had mentioned to the need of applying more medical management to these patients. The second area in which Dr. King has provided a moral compass to interventional cardiology has been in the development of the appropriateness utilization criteria for PCI our viewers will notice that we rigidly follow these criteria for every case that is webcast, webcast on the program. And I am sure uh, Samin will be showing that in one of his uh, initial slides. So once again, Dr. King, it's an honor to have you join us. And uh, I am sure uh, both uh, Dr. Fuster and Dr. Narula would like to extend their welcome to you before they leave the studios. And uh, clearly, myself and uh, uh, Anno, Dr. Keeney, uh, and our cath lab team welcome uh, uh, Dr. King especially being in the room and Dr. Fusha and Narula and happens to be that when did our first 
webcast in July of 2012. All three these um, uh, players, I would say celebrities, were there, and also for the year end at the 12th episode, all three are. It's a great privilege uh, for Mount Sinai Cat Lab and this uh, webcast to have all three of them uh, present both beginning as well as conclusion of uh, uh, the first year, and of course, it will continue. Dr. King. Well, this is a pleasure to be here, and of course, the college is very excited to do it. Work with world-class operators like you and Dr. Keeley. It's, uh, we were here a year ago, and we're back to, to cut the cake today for the one-year anniversary. The mission of the College of Cardiology, number one, is education, and I'm glad that we're involved in educating in interventional cardiology. So that, that's what it's about today, and I'm excited to be here. And uh, they made me wear the Mount Sinai hat. They made me take off my Emory hat, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, uh, except that I'm very supportive of what we're doing here. Fantastic. Okay. All right, um, uh, therefore, um, uh, Samir, we start um, our case. Samin, also congratulations to you for uh, completing your uh, 16th uh, complex coronary interventions course. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. uh, I understand there were 21 scintillating uh, genuinely complex cases which went flawless. And if uh, that wasn't enough, uh, the course concluded uh, 72 hours ago. And uh, in the meantime, you made a trip to India and there are 71 cases on schedule today. So good luck with that and uh, please take us uh, through what you're going to be showing us today. Yeah, fantastic. And actually, uh, but truly this year, our symposium was uh, uh, reached these peaks uh, um, uh, because of uh, the attendance and uh, type of the cases besides complex coronary, which we are known for, did 12 cases on uh, Thursday and more importantly on Friday, we did total five uh, percutaneous valves, three tower cases uh, with the Edward Sapien from Mount Sinai, one core valve relay from outside, and then one melody valve. So the five valve procedures were done uh, on Friday in addition to balloon valve and PDA closure. With that note, um, I'll take you quickly through our complex coronary cases with the disclosures here. And uh, this is a very interesting patient, uh, case number 12. A uh, 62-year-old male who had prior bypass in uh, August of 2004 and unfortunately, th three months later, he closed all the grafts. He actually had a Lima to LED and SVG to OM, which closed and he required BES uh, PCI using Paclitaxel eluting stent to the proximal LED uh, because of um, occluded Lima. Since then, he was fine and now has new onset class 1 uh, symptoms with the stress echo positive for moderate ischemia in the apical and infralateral areas with EF of 55%. Cath showed, which will show two vessel and left main and 99% instant restenosis of the LAD. Patient was recommended to redo cabbage and of course uh, was declined because already have a cabbage and had a bad luck that three months later his grafts closed and he's on good medical therapy and the risk factor shown. And now you can show the angiogram now. Plus. Plus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, his LV gram. Uh, normal LV function. And this is the RCA. It's the same. Uh, early bifurcation, moderate size was never bypassed. And this is what we see now. This is the distal left main, and there is a prox uh, circ as well as a prox LED. Prox LED is where the tax stent was pace, uh, placed. Now, osteal uh, uh, circ is involved, so it becomes a bifurcating distal left main, uh, Medina class 111. And if you see the circ, actually, uh, after the uh, distal circ, you can say the OM1 is a more, you know, significant disease uh, in that area too. And this is the LAD. It's a, um, you know, moderate size uh, LAD, some uh, view after the first septal diffuse uh, moderate disease but more important I think is uh, this view where you see distal left main involving uh, the prox LED which is an uh, ISR and uh, proximal sub. Yeah. Uh, and I just said this is interesting and of course appropriateness with the um, maximum medical therapy and ischemia uh, and class 1 angina makes it appropriate and this actually uh, while we are planning uh, I'll ask um, uh, Dr. King to comment on it that many patients, like this case, had a stent DES in 2004 and now presented. Now this subtotal lesion, the question is which we are seeing now, the, particularly the earlier stents that patients after, many of them actually had an angiogram 
three, four years later looked great. And now five, six years later, come back with a significant lesion in that area. Now, this is a classical case of the late DES restenosis mechanism which we'll go through. But uh, this is kind of cases which we are encountering uh, now compared to the bare metal, which we always felt that once your bare metal is done, very unlikely that uh, the patient will come back in that area lesion. Yeah, you know, the appropriateness criteria are alluded to several times here. Probably we should point out that there are many exceptions. In, in this kind of case, reoperations and so forth are simply not covered uh, adequately, but appropriateness still applies. Yes. So appropriateness is in the heart team idea, which uh, of course uh, you're using here, because your choices uh, to deal with this involve uh, you know, reoperation or not, and whereas you say the patient didn't want a reoperation, well, sure, but I mean, I think you probably don't want a reoperation either, uh, because of uh, you know the, the potential for the complications. Yeah, so uh, re, uh, you know, five, what is it, five, six, it's seven years out. Yeah, seven years. Seven and, and as far as we know, the patient's symptoms and so patient forth started recently. Patient is just only recently. last two months. Yeah, so, before so that did good for it. So question of. Uh, uh, of Neoatherosclerosis, so uh, whatever that is, which seems to be more <laughs> common uh, with drug eluding. Uh, is this because the the drug sets up a problem for this? Is it because <clears throat> of you We can talk about all those things, but uh, the late, very late uh, uh, re-narrowing of this valve of, of this uh, stent is uh, particularly uh, bothersome. Okay. Now, with that note, our point today would be talking about imaging technique of the OCT and NIRS trying to show uh, near infrared spectroscopy and the whole issue about the late DS restenosis with intimal hyperplasia or neoatherosclerosis. So I'll ask now Anu who is a mastermind in all the this imaging uh, uh, devices and technique. Uh, every case she starts, uh, it's written on the board uh, which imaging technique need to be done. Uh, and uh, we have the large number of uh, data patients who have had a multi-modality imaging and uh, just give a little highlight uh, to the viewers that what is OCT and what is NIRS and what each technique tells us about. So if you see this slide, I think just uh, two basic uh, principles it uh, shows, which is uh, optical coherence tomography versus uh, near spectroscopy. And uh, in optical coherence tomography, it uses uh, light. And uh, what it happens is uh, whatever it goes in one direction, it has to come back in the same direction. And that is why you have a, a clear and a crisp image. Uh, which you see compared to when you see the near spectroscopy which you use the infrared uh, light um, and we have of the spectrum when it goes it gets scattered and comes back that is why the image that you get is uh, diffuse uh, as you see uh, uh, in the right hand side okay and uh, with the you will go over some of what the OCT imaging various uh, pl plaques are shown uh, this is the important difference between OCT versus uh, IVAS. What we say is uh, resolution. You know, resolution with the optical coherence uh, tomography is almost 10 micrometer. That's why you see a better picture compared to IVAS. And uh, more important is also the, the, two, the difference thing is penetration. In IVAS, you have better penetration, less penetration with the OCT, but better resolution. With IVAS, you can see uh, uh, deeper down and the frame rate. With the, actually, we have the newer device OCT where the f frame rate and the speed. If you see the speed, is 36 millimeter, depending on wa wa uh, how much length of the vessel that you need to scan, and that is how you get the faster uh, uh, frame rate. So this is uh, some of the OCT pictures that we have here. If you see in the what is fibroetheroma, see the lipid which is shown on the left hand corner on the top and in the same picture further down you see the cap thickness of that particular uh, um, a plaque and uh, the cap which you see the measurement is a thin cap anything less than 65 micron is called as a thin cap and underneath that what you see is a lipid where on the right hand side you have the cap which is thick which is about 170 micron you see that and under that also is a uh, lipid let me raise a question because ivis has been the standard for looking at instant restenosis primarily because you want to see that the stent is fully expanded or not and how that fits into your treatment uh, this is a bit of a different case with very late uh, restenosis uh, 
do you plan IVIS here or can you get the same information from the OCT? We can get the same information for the OCT and also what happens with the NIRS, we have IVIS include. It uh, gives both, it gives uh, IVIS uh, image also in that. Oh, yeah, the only question is, uh, well, your point is that are there clear cut to set Under guidelines uh, what we have for the IVIS versus the OCT, I would say answer is no. No, means of a clinical indication with OCT is not there yet. And uh, this is a calcific lesion, what you see, uh, where we see that calcium, you see a clear-cut demarcation. Um, you know, there's a, a fibrous cap and a clear-cut demarcation that, that is uh, calcium. And this is uh, what you, the long view you see in the bottom, where you see a ruptured plaque with the thrombus, which is uh, with the arrow in the cross-sectional area, where you see a rupture of the cap and then there is thrombus formation. This was a case of an ACS. This is what we see, this was uh, after a stent placement, which is a very good case to see if there is a malopposition, how clear you see that on the left hand side picture there is malopposed stent, which is clearly you see with the arrows on the other side, anything that is uh, about 180 micron or more, it is uh, been defined that it is a malopposed, in which case you definitely have to go back and post dilate in this uh, uh, situation. And uh, this again same, the fully deployed stent in the lo longitudinal uh, area, but uh, if you see just at the edge of the stent, there's a nice uh, st uh, edge uh, dissection, the flap is uh, really bigger and this may uh, will require a, a, a treatment compared to a lot of uh, some uh, edge dissections that we see, we have been leaving it alone. Uh, and particularly the OCD I think is also helpful. Uh, for many of these majors, but I think the OCT real value will be with our bioabsorbable stents. Uh, and if any time you need to define the endothelization, so the OCT will continue. Now, the near spectroscopy, as you uh, seen here, it is again an invasive uh, uh, modality which uses, uh, which can detect lipid using near infrared uh, spectra. Uh, use, and what you see there is on the right, the rightmost corner is a necrotic core and there is lipid in the necrotic core and that will be displayed as yellow and what you see is called as a chemogram and the uh, red that you see is on the left hand side where there is uh, no uh, necrotic core, nice vessel wall, there is no lipid, it is shown as red and whatever you see is uh, the, uh, what you measure is called as lipid core burden index LCBI. So any uh, of the you know cases that we do you will hear this term LCBI which is called as lipid core burden index and usually it gives a number which can go from 1 to 1000. So if you say uh, the lipid core burden index is 100 that means there is lipid. If you say lipid core burden index is 5, 0 that means there is no lipid it could be it is red. So higher the number you know there is lipid and you, uh, you expect to see yellow. And this is how the machine looks um, and we will be showing the, the case today. Yeah. Now, in addition to uh, for thin uh, cap fibroatheroma, the, although the regular IVAS, you know, our grayscale IVAS may not be uh, sufficient, but the, um, uh, uh, the basically uh, virtual histology, which have shown correlation with the necrotic core and have come up with the definition of the thin cap fibroatheroma as shown here. And basically, that uh, once a plaque area of more than 40 percent and your necrotic core of more than 10 percent gives you the red layout read out and that also correlates. So now we have three tests, OCT, uh, virtual histology as well as um, uh, infrared spectroscopy nears which can all tell us about thin cap atheroma. So now then we go to this whole issue of the late DES restenosis. Now also which has been shown many many studies and this is one of them, you know the basket trial was the BMS and versus DES and they followed the patient now for almost five years and it turns out to be majority of the events is still all related to the target vessel uh, and of course many times you have perfusion defect but target vessel related events is still remain a major part of the problem whether it's a DES or BMS as shown in this study. More importantly you take the stent you can see that after even your 12 months which we say well intimal hyperplasia probably stops after but the event rate may purely largely driven by few percent TLR every year because stent thrombosis is very rare 0 0.06, 0 0.6, 0 0.1 but all because of the late TLR. So the question comes is this catch up phenomena whether it is a DES which type it is uh, with intimal hyperplasia or late stent thrombosis or neoatheroma is what 
coming up in the uh, really discussion and we also learned that from a prospect trial where the culprit region got the PCI and then those patients were followed for two, three years and they found that almost half of the event in these patients occurred from the culprit lesion, other half event occurred from the non-culprit lesion. And more importantly, these events now do not translate into death or MI, usually with the accelerated uh, angina and so. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, King, what do you think about this uh, whole concept with the prospect at least reassured us that if you are taking good medical therapy, even if you have an event, unlikely you will die or develop myocardial infarction. Yeah, uh, that's encouraging. But I think the other thing that I hope will be encouraging is that most of the information we know about neoatherosclerosis comes from uh, first-generation drug-eluting stents. And now that's of necessity because they were out long enough for us to have it. But it looks like, you know, at this point, maybe it's going to be less with second-generation stents, perhaps because of improved polymers and so forth. But we will see. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, part of that problem will be addressed by... Uh, the new, uh, the newer stents that we're now using, uh, now that we're not using those, where most of our information, particularly this one with a tax stent, obviously uh, is one of the culprits uh, for that. Absolutely, and this is basically puts it. People ask, what is neoatheroma or neoatherosclerosis? It's simple. When patient comes back, is the intimal hyperplasia. Some of that intimal hyperplasia has the yellow uh, lipid. content, lipid content, or have an ulceration and have a thin cap. Though all those factors combined makes the neoatheroma. So the neoatherosclerosis is part of the neointima at follow-up. So that not all cases of neointima are neoatherosclerosis, but based on what type of stent you are, it shows that it's higher incidence yeah. with the drug looting stent. Pressure and of course, they have shown many cases even 10, 15 years after stent deployment. This is a very nice uh, paper, um, uh, basically uh, from uh, Dr. Vermani's group which says about BMS, PES, and uh, paclitaxel and serolimus eluting, if you can see that the BES give rise to a new atherosclerotic changes much earlier in the, uh, these are autopsies cases at one and two years. BMS comes only later. And uh, clearly these are the first generation stents as uh, Dr. King pointed out. And there were no cases of the DES after six years. So that clearly that the BMS uh, has a late new atherosclerotic changes, but more importantly, DES of the first generation have a higher, earlier, and much higher incidence of neoatheroma. And this is basically uh, the duration also occurs early compared to the BMS occurs very, very late. Now, this is another paper from Park, actually uh, performing OCT and trying to look uh, for the neoatherosclerosis. And you can see there that it's a time-dependent phenomenon. At within one year, very unlikely that you will have some neoatheroma with the DES. These are all again first generation DES. Clearly after two, three years and more than three years, the incidence of single and multiple uh, areas of neointima increases and they're associated with white thrombi. And also the same, the similar uh, you know, paper uh, of talking about uh, the vir virtual histology defined thin cap atheroma, again it, uh, dependent on your duration of the stent deployment which leads to our major study which was presented from Sinai uh, by uh, our fellow Ziyad Ali who is attending at uh, uh, Columbia Presbyterian at present with uh, no, the cases about the 65 patients uh, which is that did uh, the OCT and I was when patients came back with the DES restenosis as a medium follow up of 33 plus minus 8 months. And yeah, so if you see here what uh, we found that uh, the intimal what uh, neoatherosclerosis positive which is on the left hand side the blue bar which was about a 62 percent uh, cases which we found on the top you see how many bare metal stent versus uh, des that we had seen and uh, if you see the point of the next slide what is it that the des yes, has had a higher uh, neoatherosclerosis compared to bare metal clearly which is what in the literature was those 62 percent this is based on the oct and uh, then what we did also is uh, we did both the OCT and uh, the near spectroscopy in these patients and then classified them uh, into various uh, the new atherosclerosis classification where we uh, came with the classification of one where they had a thin cap um, along with the lipid. The second was uh, cap was thick within the knee or with the lipid within the intimal hyperplasia and the other one was peristrut. Peristrut means there is lipid but uh, it is 
uh, with closer to the stented area and uh, class 4 was we found lipid but the lipid was behind the stent uh, where you can see it uh, in that particular case that means it was probably the lipid that was present even before the stent was placed not the case where it was it is truly what we say is uh, neoatherosclerosis that means the lipid was not into the uh, intima that were, came later on. I think we can agree that uh, some of these are research tools and and it's fascinating this is the first time I've seen the neoatherosclerosis image with the near infrared. In next month's Jack intervention is a, a very good uh, series very interesting for acute syndromes and, and the occurrence of the lipid. We don't know exactly uh, how we will utilize that clinically, but it's, it's critical, important information to help us understand this uh, process. Uh, go ahead, I, I want to get to this case. Yeah, and then this is basically thin. just say that thin cap, uh, neoatherosclerosis is much more common with the DES uh, compared to bare metal, 47% versus 7%. And uh, on the right hand side, if you see, they, uh, there are various, uh, I think, uh, stents. The newer generation stent as well as uh, the uh, first generation stent, they both had type 1, which means uh, more of uh, both thin cap and thick cap, and we will see uh, the clinical implication of this. I don't know where it's going, but this is obviously uh, the ability to get th the cap thickness and the lipid content together would be very fascinating. We have hoped that that could happen with a, a, a combined catheter, there's some intellectual property that's in the way of that, but uh, you can see how that might uh, be, a, be a very good clue to whether your uh, uh, plaque is vulnerable or not. Okay, and uh, what what we also saw was the lipid was detected uh, within the neo intima in uh, higher incidence along with the uh, nears compared to the OCT. And this is actually the interesting finding that uh, we make a cutoff of 65, so so that even with that, um, uh, that LCBI clearly, of 65. That, uh, that you have LCBI of uh, 65, if you take uh, 65, um, uh, that clearly that patients, if a higher, that more detected by nears. So the now OCT is better, OCT de detected in 62 percent and uh, lipid actually were found uh, based on the near uh, in uh, 89 percent of cases. Of course, this remains may, that which one is the better tool. But more importantly is this slide where the incidence of uh, periprocedural MI where um, you know as a part of uh, New York State uh, we uh, get troponin on every post PCI patients, patients who had DES uh, and had a cutting balloon whether they had a repeat stent or no stent the incidence of a post uh, you know post procedure troponin release was higher compared to the bare metal in this patient. Yeah. And this is very important finding that maybe the thin cap is the one which is going to embolize uh, later on and uh, will create a problem. With that note uh, uh, Samir, we start the case now. Where is he? <laughs> so this particular uh, case, I think for the perspective of, of people thinking about this, and it, it occurred to me last week too when you did some very difficult cases here. Uh, one of the things that's not in the appropriateness guideline is what's appropriate for who to do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's, no, there's no doubt that uh, we, we can show a lot of data about how low volume activity can be okay for some things, but for other things, you know, having extensive experience is critical and having all the backup and as talented as you two guys are, you know, without the backup in this room, you know, you be in trouble. So I think all of us have to recognize that to build a, uh, a system able to cope with these kind of patients is uh, critical. Let Spencer, me ask you one question. Spencer, how would you be doing this case at, uh, your, at your institution? No, well, he, let, let he, me, he has a question for let us. Me okay. the, let me ask this question. So one thing that some operators might be thinking about is saying, okay, this is prox LAD, it's a circuit involved, the left main is going to be a question mark about how you deal with it. Uh, what about protection? What about thinking forward? Is there any uh, rationale in a patient with prior surgery and so forth to do uh, any other kind of protection? So I'll raise the question to you. I don't see a balloon pump. I don't see a uh, uh, impella in and all those kind of things. Uh, this is just a question that some people might raise. And uh, you have not obviously felt it necessary in this case. Is yeah, right? I mean, clearly in this case, uh, uh, you're right. Uh, although the ejection fraction is normal, 
and we expect it's not a very extensive disease. So based on that, our feeling would be that if we can, uh, uh, that uh, we may not need, you know, but on my, uh, on my algorithm, knowing there's not a complex rotablation and we are going to do, so that this may be the case, we can just do it uh, without any additional uh, protection, but the, everything is in the room, uh, whatever will be required uh, to be done, uh, yeah, just by wiring, uh, this patient develops a ST segment depression, as you can see here. So, like a balloon, right? yeah. You want to open? Yeah, open. I think we, we should, I know we want to do uh, imaging studies, but in this case, uh, we definitely uh, should open uh, part of the lesion because otherwise these devices, uh, as much as we want to do, we're going to create uh, major issues. See that, uh, doctor? Just yeah, by wiring I, I this I some ST depression. Help yeah. you here with yeah. the catheter. Good. Yeah, the ST sedan is a little bradycardia, and uh, so, you know, you need to... Uh, Open this first. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is my Multiple point. Ultimately, the you LED. Have to, have to be ready to respond yeah. to hemodynamic changes. Yeah. Go. Uh, Spencer, you know, uh, would, no, you, no, no. would you have uh, put in, uh, obtained access from the other groin? Go up here. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it's, it's always uh, hard to uh, say what you would do. I think the way they're doing it is fine. I think the critical thing in all these cases, and illustrated last week in that left main case that was difficult, uh, when, when a big emergency happens, when the left main occludes, a uh, balloon pump, uh, impeller, et cetera, so on, uh, can be helpful, but not, uh, they don't solve the problem. Uh, you, have to, you have to get the artery open. And uh, that was beautifully demonstrated last week. Uh, when appropriately a, a balloon pump was put in, but at the same time uh, the artery was uh, open, stented, and that solved the uh, solved the problem of hemodynamic instability. And I think that's the critical issue: is are you prepared to make sure that anti-grade flow in the uh, coronary arteries uh, persists, and or, that, or that's interrupted a, and, that you bail it out? And that's a very important point. So that what we have the protocol that any emergency occurs. So we get another attending, and that attending the job is nothing to do with the coronary. Just put a support device, whether it's a balloon pump or let's say patient has a pericard pericardiosynthesis requires. So that person is concentrating on this one item while the main interventionist is trying to uh, establish the flow. So this is exactly happened. Prakash Krishna put a balloon pump right away, uh, and um, uh, and um, and we uh, while we are opening the vessel. Yeah, I know you agree with this, but the. Uh Balloon pump is a uh, help. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's there, a little yeah. support. It's yeah. not a solution. Okay, exactly. Bob. That's for sure. Start. Yeah, start. So, Samin, after okay, dilating that uh, quickly, the okay, patient start, became start, more start, comfortable. Quickly, yes. Be yeah, because STs back, are better. No ST changes. No bradycardia. Things looks good. Excellent. And now we are. Doctor, the, the Ivers is playing that. Spencer. In the meantime, uh, I've received uh, numerous emails welcoming you to the show. Beautiful. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to be here. There are uh, a couple of questions which have also crept in for you, which I'll, in the so, appropriate so are, uh, uh, moments of the, the case, we'll take it. Sure. And you are play. We are playing both. It's the IVAS as well as uh, the infrared nears. We uh, see that. Also, yeah, but we uh, see the IVAS images at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. You the nears will come later on. Right. So what is IVIS, the stent, what size stent was this originally, do we know that? The it was a Texas stent, trio, likely trio. Trio of uh, fifth, uh, trio, uh, 16. Uh, 16. Okay. And okay, currently this is the, the left stent, vein. Uh, we saw it a moment ago. Yeah, now we are in the left vein. Okay, we are coming to the guide. I'm going to take it out. Okay. Okay, good. And the near no, demonstration. Where is that? So that's lipid. Yeah. Is it uh, within that uh, lesion, right? Yes. It's no. within the lesion. So just give the, you know, within the four millimeter. How much? You see that arc on the right? Okay. Show where the lipid is. The arc. See that yellow arc? Yeah. Yes. It is, we see. It's uh, try, uh, trying to tell us that between a two to four o'clock position of that particular of the stent. That is. That's where we see the lipid. Get the so OCD the stent down. seems to be close to three millimeters in diameter, I guess, uh, and clearly, the problem here is nothing about stent recoil. Of course, it's right. it's all new tissue within the stent. 
and some of that tissue appears to have lipid in it. I, you know, this is a this is a research uh, a kind of uh, investigation. I mean, we we I think would all agree that uh, we don't have definitive answers of what uh, what the uh, lipid content means at the present, but that is going to be very helpful as we learn more about it. Hundred percent agree. There's a lot of diffuse disease of the vessels. I know this patient is diabetic also. Good. But now we are going to do, what are you planning now? The OCT. Now we are See, going the to only um, issue with the OCT is a couple of times we will not get uh, good images. One, if it's in the proximal part of the vessel, especially the ostium, if it is too tight, if the vessel is too big. So let's see whether we can, so since we dilated it, we should be able to get uh, so I was mentioned that this patient is diabetic. I should point out for Dr. Fuster's benefit <laughs> that uh, indeed in the Freedom Trial we did not have patients who had, had prior surgery uh, yes. as, yep. as part of the uh, condition. That's it. Uh, so and, and uh, this patient actually is very interesting. The hemoglobin A1C is 6.2, LDL is uh, 72, so very well managed. HDL listed on low side, 36. Uh, but rest are uh, very good. He's, but uh, despite controls. that, uh, he has developed a new disease. Spencer, this is exactly what the first question uh, to you was, that there is uh, too much unscientific uh, conversations uh, regarding uh, the role of uh, diabetics and the role of surgery there. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the situation? Uh, no, I mean, the, the situation, uh, the, the information from Freedom is I think we are good. incredibly good. definitive, but what we should all realize is that uh, Freedom had a defined uh, population, and then you get uh, in Freedom Go and Syntax and every other study, you have uh, patients that uh, are not okay, part good. of that study. They're not included. Yeah. Th this is one giving? of them. Where not 16. You have to take that information. Okay, the fact of the diabetes is important, but then you have to integrate that into what are the okay, circumstances. And this one, uh, this patient uh, with this situation would be appropriate for surgery and uh, not inappropriate for surgery at all, uh, it's a balance between what can be accomplished in the local situation with intervention and what could be accomplished with surgery and what the relative risks are. And this is more and more, I think, will be integrated into our recommendations. You see? Uh, and, and there are things that are hard to do because we like to generalize completely, but it's... Uh, what the, the, the real answer is for a patient in any location, what is the best treatment for that specific patient? Absolutely. Uh, here, I completely what agree that uh, a reoperation in a patient uh, like this uh, would not be inappropriate, but in balance, uh, given okay, the capabilities, I think yeah, that the recommendation here is correct. Okay. All right, uh, Anu, what did we see on the OCT tell us? No, you can see. Now, this is the 3D OCT that uh, just came out uh, like uh, early part of May. Only uh, Mount Sinai was the first one to get it. They are doing the 3D reconstruction there on the long view. You see the vessel. Now, she's rotating the entire vessel, if you can see it. That's a branch you're seeing. Point out the branch. Yeah. But then, let's go to the stent on the long view. Yeah. You see that. But then... Come back to where the Titus legion is, to the right side. Yeah, at right mark, about yeah, 35. Right there, yeah. yeah, right around there. Now you go, go back to your 3D reconstruction. Yeah. Now the most important thing is uh, go to the cross-sectional area where you see the intimal hyperplasia. Yeah. No, 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 the, on the right, this one. Here, here, this, this one. Yeah, yeah. Make it bigger. You want to see if the... See where the stent is and show us where the. No, you can't see anything. 3D off. Go, give me the long view. I was asked how we would approach this uh, in, in routine uh, situation in my yes, place. Sir. We would, we would uh, probably do IVIS as the uh, as the routine for this lesion. Uh, then uh, document that the stent was uh, deployed adequately. Uh, then uh, go ahead and dilate. Yeah, we would have had that. to dilate early because of the 
hemodynamic instability. But the real question is so going to come just with in that one management of this and what's, what's done. And there are several emerging technologies that are going to be no, interesting so the for the future. One of them is not available in the U.S. right now, so I know that won't be part of it, but we'll talk about it later. Uh, and we'll see I, what Dr. Okay, Sharma plans to do yeah, with this. Compare uh, the two. So now uh, if you see. Yeah. You see, see that? Yes, I know we see it very nicely now. So you are, uh, show the lipid. Uh, this is where your lipid is. At uh, between 1, 2 o'clock, and that's exactly what you saw in the nears also. Right. Around between 2 and 3 was yeah. 2 and 4. So exact. this is exactly where our classification was based on. So if you see the strength strut, then you have your intimal hyperplasia. The lipid is in the intimal hyperplasia. So fascinating uh, images, uh, great uh, demonstration, but how do you use it uh, practically? How does this help you in making decisions for this case? Now, the uh, practical implication here, I mean, though we have to uh, prove that as anything like we showed, that if they had, your, I think cap thickness is uh, thin here, right? Looks like it's yeah, less uh, than 60 before, micron. Yeah, uh, show, show the cap. Before you, you take that off, before you take that off, notice the uh, uh, cap, a flat cap under that uh, uh, lipid, notice how bright it is. And uh, if this is a thin cap. I mean, uh, we are talking oh, that side? Yeah, on the, on the, uh, uh, one, Behind the one, one to three o'clock yeah. uh, area. The, the, the brightness uh, has been reported by some as indicating a high macrophage content. Now, we don't know that for sure, yep. but, but this is going to be interesting. Uh, to think about Six, eight, 10, in the future, where this is also predictive—a thin cap with heavy macrophage infiltration—is uh, the pres uh, could this, uh, you know, embolize and uh, actually cause periprocedural MI? That is what we saw in that uh, uh, study that we did. You know, prospectively, when we did cases of ISR with uh, both this imaging modality, definitely patients, uh, uh, DS patients, uh, had a higher incidence of a periprocedural uh, MI. Now the question appropriately comes up, what is the practical implication of these things? And I hope everyone understands that this is, uh, uh, number one, mission here is to fix this patient, but uh, number two is to uh, provide education that Looking has to do CC. with these emerging technologies and how they may be helpful to us in understanding and treating patients. Spencer, you, you discuss a very important part uh, over the last four years. Uh, we've tried to balance uh, uh, our uh, demonstration of the practical aspects of the case with uh, uh, showcasing uh, some of the emerging uh, technology, keeping in mind uh, never to let any conflict of interest emerge. In. Spencer, uh, uh, question for you. What are your thoughts on BVS? Um, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think it's very exciting uh, possibility. Uh, you know, with any advance in technology, I think what we have to be interested in knowing is what is the problem that we're setting out to solve. So bioabsorbable uh, scaffolds are, of course, have been a dream for a long time. I think that uh, maybe some, in some minds, it's gotten a little ahead of, of, of uh, the science because uh, uh, whereas the scaffold is going to go away, the patient's artery is not returned to totally normal state. I think that most, most of you completely understand that. On the other hand, as these, this, this is the early generation of this bioabsorbable technology, and the fact that uh, it's being used successfully uh, in many conditions, uh, all outside the U.S. with the exception of the current trial, I think is, uh, is very exciting uh, because I, I anticipate some dramatic uh, continuing improvements in the bioabsorbal technology. And uh, as it becomes, uh, we probably will develop uh, certain indications where it's uh, uniquely appropriate. Right, right. Uh, you know, you can think about instant restenosis. Well, uh, you know, one of the solutions, of course, is to put another layer of stent there. We don't, none of us like this idea of multiple uh, stents, stents within stents. 
if we can Are avoid it, but that up? is currently probably the most effective way to assure uh, the artery stays open because that's the way you deliver the drug. But uh, there may come a time when uh, you can put something in that will then uh, go away, leaving only the original uh, stent to support, but uh, no more no more metal. So there may be that. There may be a very uh, long, diffuse disease where the full metal jacket has not been uh, something that we like to do, and uh, there, there are a number of specific indications. Spencer uh, staying uh, on the international uh, uh, no, arena. The, the, the important, the important right. thing uh, is to uh, concentrate on this particular case, and I don't want to distract anything mm -hmm. because it's uh, going to be uh, necessary to, uh, there's some hemodynamic instability that needs to be Address addressed, it, and that's right. the most important issue. And the, and the wiring of the circumflex we see is a big challenge there. The same thing uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Spencer King said that once you close the vessel, uh, what is going to happen and clearly the circuit is very important in this particular case. We might just put a stent first in the circumflex while we are trying to get a balloon pump ready. Um, tell them to get one of the other attending ready in this room. Give us a fine cross. So we'll same, you know, these things will happen and so that you need to uh, get ready. Um, Anu, what wire do you have there? We tried with the fielder, it's not going. We are mm -hmm. going to try now, run through. Yeah, I think working. what happened is, the, we did an angel sculpt and they probably lifted up one of the plaque mm -hmm. uh, at the proximal edge. You are the fine cross? Yeah. Well, that whole area was very ulcerated uh, yeah. to, to start with. And, uh, What's the other wire you have? Get me the... Go with the fielder. Yeah, another the fielder wire. Yeah. yeah. Take all give, this out. Give us another fielder, yes. All the imaging, uh, yeah. you want it there? Yeah. Fielder. The patient is becoming wide complex. No, no, no. That's because uh, he's uh, ST depressions with. Give us the shape for the. No, but why the pressure is very low? Okay, you follow this. I'm going to do a balloon pump now. Okay, open the balloon pump, please, quickly. What do you need now? I have a four Okay, give us the sheet. Yeah, give one CC of Epi there. Two. Yeah, and uh, flush it. We may need to incubate. Huh? Yeah. Don't put a stand. Yeah, yeah, this, we yeah. lost it. Yeah, put a... No, no, yeah. let's get the balloon, open the left main. Yeah, put the, yeah, put the stand. Give us a 3.520 stand quickly. Get a... 3.520. Yeah, 3.520 stand. There's a balloon. Yeah. yeah. Give a atropine also. Here, here, here. We come, can come, get come. One more hold this, hold this. Fellow. Okay. Come here. CV. Come, come, come. Now we need to dilate, guys, this uh, before we put a stand. I mean, before we put the balloon? Balloon, yeah. Here. Dilate one of you. You guys stay on the front. Yeah, give more uh, epi. And we need anesthesia dilate, to intubate dilate, it. Quickly. You go can give again. full 5 cc of that IP. Go up, go up. Go up. Down. You no, put a stand directly now. You dilated already, you need to put a stand. So give us a short sheath first. Yeah, 5 fresh sheath. The stent is here. Okay, we're calling the anesthesia. Yeah, stand. Did you call anesthesia? Give us a five French sheets, guys. Yes, yes, no flow. Yeah. Put a stent quickly, that's what I'm saying. Go with the stent directly. Okay. 
one of the fellow come here yeah. while they're putting a stand five French sheep. Five French sheath quickly. Yeah, is there a CJ here? Wait, one second. Now put the, the dilator first. Hold the one. Put your scent quickly. Establish the left main foot. I can't see. Okay. Yes, there we do ECMO go. Go too far. Come up to the Austin. No, put both. No, no, no. You want the Austin? Yeah, yeah. No, no, there's nothing there in Austin. Okay, proximal, yeah. Good. Far a little die. Some die. Yeah. yeah. Good. Dial it, yeah. Go up. Good. Good. Down, down. Down, down, down. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Shock him, shock him, shock him. Shock him! Do you need another sheath? Do you need a different sheath? What do we do usually? Uh, what what size? Give us a seven. Okay, go. Good. Get a uh, seven French sheet. Give me a seven and a half French sheet. Quickly. Give me an eight French sheet. Eight French sheet, yeah. The stent is done. Flush it now. Okay, take this. No. Yep. Yeah, good. Get the sheet quickly. Don't worry, you just go in. Okay, some die. Some die. No, dilated will have been done. Die. Anti grade flow is there. Bad. Go. No, that's okay. Go. Okay, good. This is the first uh, time in 48 sessions, four years, that uh, uh, we've experienced uh, such instability in a patient that uh, we had to even. Uh, move the camera crew out uh, temporarily so that uh, they could take care of the patient. Uh, uh, I will uh, faithfully give you uh, feedback on this patient. I know many of you are uh, uh, still online. Uh, I'm also trying to contact uh, uh, Dr. King if he could come uh, to the studio which is adjoining to the cath lab so that uh, uh, we'll continue our uh, conversation, benefit from his presence. Uh, learn exactly uh, how he would have managed this uh, patient, what were some of his uh, concerns and some other uh, observations as he saw the patient uh, uh, being uh, treated uh, subsequent uh, uh, and the placement of the balloon pump as well as some other issues. So uh, we'll join you momentarily as I get uh, uh, Dr. King uh, back in the studios and thank you for staying uh, online. Uh, I am back in the recording uh, studios and I have requested Dr. King to join us. Uh, Spencer, uh, you had the most uh, uh, prophetic, uh, uh, I might uh, add, uh, not a good feeling, uh, somewhere in the very early part of the case where you talked about hemodynamic instability. Uh, no, I, uh, this uh, case has uh, been extraordinarily difficult to have a complication like this. Uh, I, uh, no, I, I thought it was, it was going to go fine, as did the others. Uh, but you always have to be prepared for uh, whatever uh, comes up. And, of course, working around the left main uh, in, entails the possibility of uh, trouble. And the trouble here is that the uh, circumflex occluded and in in rewiring it is not, uh, yeah. is, is, not, uh, is not easy. Uh, the... Uh, and then the hemodynamic uh, uh, collapse. So what uh, you have to decide early on here is whether to move toward uh, trying to support this patient with uh, ECMO, which is uh, what they're trying to do now. And uh, so uh, th this, uh, this particular uh, uh, situation, which appeared from the uh, IVUS to be uh, rather... Uh, Routine in the LAD, but uh, but uh, the problem of the shift of the circumflex, and this is not, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether this is carina shift, you know, or whether this is extrusion 
of some material around. We, you know, I don't have right, the answer right to that. At right at the first uh, angiograph uh, which was taken, uh, I had mentioned, uh, you know, the distal left main and the proximal and osteal cirque had a very ulcerated uh, look to it. And uh, it is also possible that with the multiple uh, passages of the OCT and uh, I was uh, maybe, maybe that, as you mentioned, there was a plaque shift too. Well, you know, one of the usual uh, ways to approach instant restenosis is the use of uh, either cutting balloon or scoring balloon of some sort. And this uh, was discussed a lot last week during the course with Antonio Colombo talking about this uh, uh, and uh, kind of bailing uh, out from the uh, these type balloons. But uh, th the main reason for using those kind of balloons is they don't uh, watermelon seed, they don't slip and whatnot. Uh, is there some downside for them? I mean, we try to learn about this and whether this uh, turns out to be uh, a uh, issue for the um, uh, for cutting. I mean, if we know these are this is information we never had before. What is the plaque thickness? What is the uh, you know what in the world is uh, uh, neoatherosclerosis? I mean, this is all kind of a new territory and. Um, if it's a lipid laden, if it's a thin cap fibroatheroma, if it's within a stent, then uh, when you compress it, where does it go? Uh, is it best to cut it? Is it best to uh, uh, balloon it with a high pressure balloon? Wait, these these are completely unanswered questions. Uh, the selection of what to do with this case, obviously, everybody would uh, would love to be in the in the OR with this case instead of in the cath lab. So that decision, unfortunately, you can never make in retros uh, retrospect. Uh, but uh, given uh, the success in this kind of case, you think that, you know, things are going to go well. Uh, if they don't, uh, then you can always say, well, we should have gone the other way, of course. But uh, uh, I think uh, we've all been in situations like this. And, uh, you know, despite uh, the, the best help you can possibly have, some of these cases don't... Uh, turn out uh, the way you had anticipated, well, hopefully, and uh, we'll, we hope, hope that uh, they can uh, uh, bail this out. But it's a very, very difficult uh, complication right, yeah. now with the patient going on uh, ECMO to see if they can uh, salvage it. Right. Uh, as I had mentioned to our viewers, uh, in four years, this is the first time we have been forced to go uh, offline, and uh, hopefully, hopefully the patient uh, will be salvaged. And uh, I have also mentioned to the viewers that I will... Uh, uh, faithfully get back to them with uh, with an update. In the meantime, uh, I have the benefit of you uh, joining us. Uh, during, uh, uh, as the OCT was being done, you had stated that uh, there are some other technologies which could be uh, used. Were you talking about a drug uh, eluting uh, balloon at that time? Uh, yeah, so just uh, generically thinking about instant restenosis, the drug eluting balloon is has uh, developed a following in uh, Europe and other places uh, because it's now you know, you see CE mark there. Uh, there are some studies comparing uh, stent to drug eluting balloon, uh, and the drug eluting balloon seems to be holding its own. The advantage there being that uh, you don't have to put another stent, you don't get double layer stents in there. And uh, so this, this will be something that will be uh, interesting. I, I predict it will be eventually approved in the U.S. and will be... Uh, uh, something that uh, maybe there will be other versions of ways to protect the artery from restenosis without having to put another stent in. Y you know, this. Uh, getting back to this uh, this case, case yeah. uh, y you say it's the first time in four years that you've had to go offline. I I can say that uh, the same does not apply to me. We've done live case demonstrations from, in the very first uh, course that we did at Emory. Uh, with Andreas, going back to 1981, okay. uh, early 81. And uh, the uh, uh, case, as I recall, it was a single vessel. There was uh, a nice A-type lesion, apparently. Uh, it was the last case of the course. I was moderating. Andreas Grunzig was doing the case. And we made the point, and he made the point uh, specifically, that for people starting angioplasty, this is the kind of case they should do. Mm -hmm. You put the balloon in, dilated it, there was an immediate occlusion of the artery with dissection, no stents in those days. And uh, shortly thereafter, there was CPR going on and there was a rush to the emergency room, to the operating room. Uh, Did you I have an always, option off I, a balloon pump at that time? 
uh, you know, I think a balloon pump went in and so forth. But, but the, the, the point was that this was the recommendation of, for the audience. Okay, if you're going to do this, this is the kind of case you should do. I've always felt that that case may have served a point in telling some people, maybe this is not for me. Uh, this is not completely predictable. Maybe this is not something we should do in our institution, or maybe that particular individual should not do. For this uh, kind of uh, situation, uh, it is not uh, uh, ever completely predictable how things will go, and therefore you need every possible uh, backup to take on these kind of cases. And uh, my judgment was that this case in this circumstance was uh, entirely appropriate for this approach. Uh, Dr. Sharma has joined us. Yeah. yeah I think, uh, maybe I can just uh, sum that up. Uh, clearly, unfortunate uh, uh, complication of left main closure occurred uh, after our angioscore balloon angioplasty of uh, the osteal LAD and uh, for transiently give a total cardiovascular cessation. And uh, we put a balloon pump and uh, continue CPR. And at present, the surgeons are in the room and putting the patient on ACMO. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, to have a reasonable recovery, uh, but it's a tough case, uh, did happen, good ejection fraction, and uh, it just uh, cardiovascular collapse occurred because of the transient left main closure, which is having some flow now, but it will require a little more extra time, and uh, knowing that uh, our s the webcast has gone quite uh, long now, uh, we'll give the follow-up of this patient later on, but uh, the pre present time is the patient is getting uh, ACMO in the cath lab by our surgeons. Samin, uh, thank you. That's a very, very useful uh, uh, feedback. I know many viewers are online, and uh, uh, I think this helps them uh, come to terms as to what is uh, happening uh, with the case. Uh, Spencer, did you want to add anything uh, further? Uh, not really. I think. Uh, and in the meantime, that, that the I, only I, thing I, I would say is that this uh, this kind of uh, activity. Uh, some always uh, raise the question about uh, live case demonstration. Uh, I can vouch that this case was handled by the expert people in the most uh, best judgment they had of how to handle the case. There was no compromise made for the uh, transmission. Uh, there, yes, there was discussion, uh, scientific discussion beforehand. But everything that happened, happened because this plaque, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, shifted and, and blocked this circumflex and up ultimately the left main. And then the very usual uh, ability to get back in that circumflex right. was, was not there for whatever reason we don't actually know. But uh, you can never be uh, completely confident of everything, and I think this is sobering for for all of us, uh, yes, we we uh, would have preferred another approach to the patient in retrospect, but the retrospectoscope, unfortunately, is not available to us. I also remember, uh, you may have forgotten, Spencer, uh, uh, more than a decade, almost two decades ago at uh, uh, Jim Margolis' uh, meeting, uh, uh, I had just finished my training, uh, started working with him, and uh, I had asked you, Spencer, uh, what is the best lesson you could give me as an uh, angioplaster starting a career? And you said, look, uh, uh, possibly the hardest thing in angioplasty is to master when to stop. So I've, uh, I've remembered those words. In the meantime, we've had uh, several uh, emails uh, uh, from uh, several viewers talking, uh, providing their uh, support for this uh, difficult case and for the patient. Uh, we will uh, provide you uh, a follow-up uh, uh, either through email uh, and definitely during our uh, uh, next discussion uh, with those uh, uh, somewhat uh, solemn words, uh, Spencer, we remain uh, grateful for your uh, support. Uh, uh, we thank you for uh, joining us today and uh, I'll let you share any final words uh, with the audience. Well, the ACC remains committed to educate people. Uh, this is an unfortunate lesson. Uh, we don't know what to take from it exactly yet. Perhaps we will as we uh, learn more. But uh, just to point out that uh, there's no uh, guarantee 
of uh, a good result. Uh, it, although 99.9 percent .9 of the time uh, here it, it turns out fine for such a case. Uh, the questions will always be asked should there be other uh, preparation for balloon pump and so forth. You notice that balloon pump went in, balloon pump did not solve did this problem. Yeah, uh, this is a, when you occlude the left main, the only solution is to either get it open or, or to get them uh, uh, on ECMO, get into the operating room. As, as I watched the case more, I realized that uh, it truly was, uh, you know, the circumflex and the inability to get the wire there. And then now that we have added uh, uh, quick uh, to salvage the left main, the stenting of the left main access to the circumflex is going to be even harder should that situation arise. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me here and uh, wish you the best. Thank you so much, yeah. Spencer. Uh, we are going to conclude uh, our transmission. Uh, our next uh, webcast will be July 16th and in the meantime, uh, we'll try to post uh, uh, some detail and closing remarks on the case. Uh, I remain uh, grateful uh, uh, for Dr. S uh, King to have joined us. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Narula and Dr. Valentin Foster, and uh, to so many of you who have wished this patient and us well uh, during this webcast, uh, thank you so much. We will join you July 16th for session 49. Thank you. <laughs>